Hi, Stephen from Owner Disown here. Well, today I've uh, got the ASUS ZenBook Flip 14. It is available in two models. The cheapest one for $899 is an i5, 8 gigabytes of RAM, and a 256 gigabyte SSD. Or the model I have has the uh, i7-8550U CPU, 16 gigabytes of RAM, a 512 gigabyte SSD and dedicated NVIDIA MX150 graphics. Now both are two-in-ones and they both come with the, with the ASUS Ntrig pen. Now ASUS touts this as being the thinnest two-in-one with dedicated graphics and indeed it is only half inch uh, thick or 13 millimeters and at three and a half pounds or one and a half kilos it makes for a nice portable package. As is typical of many aluminium laptops by ASUS its lid is nicely brushed into a circular pattern that helps the cats and reflect light nicely. I do like its uh, dark metallic uh, colour finish. It makes a change from uh, the, uh, the bright silver models we get and it does feel quite premium in the hand. Now despite its thin proportions, the screen has little to no uh, screen flex. The underside is also made out of aluminium. It has uh, four solid rubber feet, an air intake grill and stereo Harman Kardon speakers. Now, don't let the name fool you. These speakers are very mediocre at best, producing 69 decibels. Perhaps they would be better if they fired upwards, you know, from the, uh, the, the back of the screen here. Um, but, you know, don't expect to hear much in a fairly noisy room. Now, thankfully, there is a volume rocker on the left-hand side, which, you can, uh, which allows it to be used in tablet mode. Also on the left-hand side, there is an air vent, a USB 3 port, uh, and the power button. Now on the right hand side, there is a micro SD card slot, a USB-C port, combo headphone microphone jack, and a USB 3 port. So you can use this in uh, regular laptop mode, tent mode, and of course, in tablet mode. And there's little to no screen flex when it's actually in tablet mode. And of course, the keyboard is deactivated when it's like this. Although it is a bit heavy to use as a tablet without uh, resting it on anything, it is okay for use uh, for taking notes and resting it on your arm or on a desk. The ASUS Pen has 1024 levels of sensitivity. It does a good uh, job of palm rejection, but my initial impression was a little bit mixed, to be honest. I would find that it would often miss the first pen strokes or sometimes uh, miss strokes while I'm writing. And this was a little bit frustrating. Now this would happen with other pens too, such as the Surface Pen or the Bamboo Ink. Now the problem did seem to get a little better over time, but one of my other viewers mentioned it also. It does write to the edge of the screen and the eraser button works pretty well. You can also use the pen in, in drawing applications or even sculpting programs like ZBrush, um, but often such programs make use of good keyboard shortcuts, so you may want to stick in laptop mode, but certainly has the horsepower to run such programs easily. Now the hinges do feel quite solid and the screen doesn't move backwards when you're actually touching the screen, which is nice and I do like that, but you cannot open it with one hand. Now ASUS says that it has been tested with 20,000 cycles, so it should last a long time. Now the trackpad houses an inbuilt fingerprint reader, now made by Elan. Yep, they make poor trackpads and even worse fingerprint readers. This one is a waste of time. I've tried it multiple times with multiple different fingers and the vast majority of time you end up using your pin number. Fortunately, as a touchpad, it uses Windows Precision Drivers and it works well, as does the touchscreen. And the keyboard is actually indented and has 1.4 millimeters of travel. They are backlit white with three levels of brightness. Now the 14 inch full HD screen has a nano edge bezel here of, you know, of just seven millimeters at the sides. It claims to have 178 degree viewing angles, you know, and, and certainly outdoors, it works fine. You can still see it. And its brightness, though, is middle of the, the road. It comes nowhere near the Dell XPS 13, but it's much, much better and brighter than the HP NV360 I just reviewed. Its color accuracy is similar to the XPS 13 with 93% of sRGB and 72% of Adobe RGB, making it a decent uh, laptop for photo work. The big issue with the screen is that it exhibits PWM flicker all the way until it gets to 100% brightness, and that is when it is plugged in. On battery, it still flickers at 100% brightness when you have it set to battery uh, saver mode. Um, but you have to move the slider to the next power level for that to go away. Fortunately, the effect uh, on the battery life isn't too bad. Now, at 25% brightness and power saver, I got 9.5 hours. 
and using the setting uh, to eliminate the PWM, I got seven hours, so that is still reasonable and will get you through most of the day. To back this up, using the included 65 watt charger, it was able to go from 6% to 72% in 60 minutes. I tried using my AOS gaming box to see if power would go through the USB-C port, but it didn't. It could well be that it wasn't counterpart compatible as it's not a Thunderbolt to enable the port on the laptop here. And this is a shame. I failed to understand why ASUS does not include a Thunderbolt port on here. Don't they make their own external graphics dock? Top here is the uh, webcam, so that's nice. So, HD webcam. I think it looks like a 720p one, but it looks pretty clear. I like it. To get inside, you have to remove 10 Torx screws. You have the two speakers here, a 57 watt hour battery. The M.2 SSD is here with a tamper proof sticker. The GPU and the CPU are here with two, two shared heat pipes and an Intel Wi-Fi card here. The RAM, I suspect, is uh, soldered on underneath the motherboard. I was impressed with the drive's uh, read speed of about 1600 megabytes per second and write speed up to 580. Now, if you use a uh, micro SD card, it does slot fully into the laptop, and I must say, I was very impressed. Copying a four gigabyte file took twice as long as other laptops, but copying it back to the SSD was blazing fast. It, it only took five to six seconds, versus about 45 seconds on the ASUS Ryzen laptop, even though that too was uh, copying it to an SSD. Now, most laptops uh, exhaust air out of the hinge area here, which I feel often uh, inhibits airflow. So I like it that uh, the hot air is blown out of the side vent here, which is on the left-hand side, and it's away from most people's hands, but, you know, the mouse hand. Now, the fan is quiet too, at about 28 decibels under full load, but how hot does the chassis get? Well, middle of the keyboard is 33 degrees Celsius. The AWSD keys um, are at uh, 30, the right-hand side 33, trackpad at 29 degrees. The hinge area where the heat pipes are at 46, but underneath, this can reach to about 52 degrees, and indeed it does get rather hot when it's on your lap. Now, my main gripe with the laptop is its power supply. First, the plastic sheathing on the cable is so thin that I had multiple areas uh, showing bare wires after my chair rolled over it. Now, one would think that 65 watts would be sufficient given that the power pull from the wall under load was only 52 watts. But you will notice that the frame rate in games would randomly go up and down, often going into the teens, and this would make gameplay very frustrating. You can clearly see the clock speed of the GPU dipping down to 139 megahertz, even when there is no movement in the game. In the 3D settings, I tried uh, changing uh, the power management to max performance or consistent performance, which actually made no difference at all. I also changed the power profiles back to uh, how they used to be, you know, in like uh, in early Windows, in Windows 7 or Windows 8, and I uh, selected high performance and made sure that the PCI link uh, state power management was off. Again, no difference. So thankfully, the solution was to get a 90 watt power supply. These cost about $25, and I'll put a link in the description below to the one I bought. You still need to select max performance in the 3D settings, but the problem goes away, and the GPU clock rate no longer dipped to 139 MHz, and the frame rate was much more consistent. Now, before I launch into the uh, testing a little bit, I want to just mention a little bit about these uh, new quad-core CPUs, the 8th generation ones. They replaced the 15-watt dual-core parts and added two extra cores while still pulling a I mean, you know, a maximum of 30 watts. Now, this does allow for much better performance and good battery life, so it's ideal for these thin and light laptops. And, uh, you know, comparing it to the i7-7700HQ, which is a 45-watt part, this would certainly produce less heat. The problem is that so far, only Dell seems to have allowed them to maintain a high boost clock out of the box. Most will clock up and down a lot during its workload, so in order to keep its power at, you know, at about 15 watts. To solve this, it requires a little bit of work, unfortunately. Normally, just using throttle spot to increase the turbo, uh, turbo power solves the problem, but in this case, I had to use both XTU and throttle stop. Now, XTU makes settings stick in the BIOS much more better than throttle stop does. So, here are my settings. In throttle stop, I have an undervolt of 120 millivolts, the processor core ICC max at 64 amps, the turbo boost power max at 61, and the boost power window as low as it will go. In throttle stop, I change the speed shift EPP to one, and this helps to lock in the clock rate. I uncheck BD processor hot, and then change the multipliers to 32. 
during this uh, long video encode I do, the clock rate remains high and fairly consistent, but the temperature still gets pretty hot on such a long test. In shorter tests, like Cinebench R15, you can get the multipliers all the way up to 3.6 and still get great scores, but you will get throttling in longer running applications. So in my handbrake test, it took 61 minutes to encode my four gigabyte video file, which is about 13% sl slower than the Surface Book 2 and much slower than the Dell XPS 13. In fact, it was similar to the Ryzen 5 2500U. But look what happens when you apply my turbo tweak. 47 minutes, 25 seconds puts it slightly ahead of both the Surface Book and the Dell XPS 13. This is why I have said all along, there's little advantage getting the i7 over the i5 and paying more for it, if, if you have the option to configure it that way. In my Lightroom test, where I convert 50 photos to a video slideshow, again, we see some benefit applying the Turbo Boost, but not as good as the Surface Book 2 or the, uh, nor the 45 watt i7 7700HQ. These quad-core thin laptops are now more viable than video rendering options, uh, you know, particularly if you're traveling on the road. It performed well using my Magix video editing software, putting in transitions was smooth, and I experienced no lag. With my Turbo Boost uh, locked in at 3.2 GHz, it rendered the 4GB uh, file in 66 minutes, which, you know, isn't that bad when you consider that the 8-core Ryzen 7, uh, 1700 took 53 minutes. Looking at the non-gaming CPU performance, we average 80 degrees uh, Celsius at stock and 87 degrees when boosted up to 3.2 gigahertz. You can clearly see the difference in average clock rate. An extra 700 megahertz isn't to be sniffed at. So, although the MX150 is not really a gaming uh, GPU, Asus claims it offers four times the performance over Intel's HD620. It is actually the, the, the mobile version of the desktop GT1030 and has 384 shader cores and a 64-bit memory bus. Officially, it is the successor to the 940MX, which I reviewed uh, here. Its clock rate is at 1468 MHz, boosting to 1532. As you can see, it's, it plays most games perfectly fine, as long as you have that 90 watt power brick. You will notice, though, that the clock rate is mostly less than the default, but it does occasionally boost into the 1600s. It is perfect for gaming at uh, 1280 by 720 at low to medium settings. And uh, here I compare it to the Dell XPS 13 with integrated HD620 graphics and the AMD-based HP NV360 with the Vega 8 graphics. Note, these uh, tests were actually done with the default 65 watt power supply that everybody gets. We get nowhere near the four times Intel performance. Still, at these settings, we get 40% over the Vega 8 and 135% uh, faster than the Intel HD620. Even, even medium settings is playable at uh, 1080p in some games. Now in Doom or Overwatch, we see about a 60% advantage over the Intel HD620, which is much less. This is because these games are more CPU dependent. Both the CPU and the, uh, the GPU are cool whilst running games, averaging, you know, in the 60s. This time, there is only a 400 megahertz difference between the stock CPU uh, compared to it with it being boosted. The GPU max turbo boost was in the 1600s. Even with the MX150 overclocked by 273 megahertz, it didn't always boost up ahead of the uh, stock clock. Sometimes it would go to up to 1800 megahertz, but not in every game. Even so, overclocking the GPU only gives about two to three extra FPS. So to be honest, I don't really see there's much point. So to conclude, um, the Asus ZenBook Flip 14 is a decent laptop. At $1,300, you get a decent amount of storage, you get a decent amount of RAM, and a dedicated graphics card with pen support. The downsides include the, la the lack of a Thunderbolt 3 port, too weak a power supply, and that poor screen flicker at all but the brightest screen setting. Still, it is fairly lightweight. It's good build, build quality got good build quality and a decent battery life, so it's good for both business and if you're a student on a campus. Its dedicated graphics card can also help in certain applications that support it. Now I'd like to thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.